Good morning. I'm going to be the moderator of this panel. Each of the speakers will have 13 minutes, and after that there will be a time for Q&A. This session ends at 11, so we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. We'll go from north to south. So first we'll give the floor to Luis, after that to Gustavo, and finally Agustin, who is from the south. So without further ado, let's start with this panel. Luis Robles Steran is an agricultural engineer, a career advisor, and an expert in weeds. Questions may be asked using an SMS sent to the number 341-604-8169, and the questions will be answered at the end of the three presentations. Bueno, no está cargada la presentación todavía de Luis. Eh... Luis is presentation is not ready yet, we'll switch speakers, so Gustavo will go first. I'm going to introduce Gustavo Duarte. He is an agricultural engineer. He graduated from Buenos Aires University. He's a director of a consultancy firm, and he is also a technology director of Grupo Bermejo Group. He is a member of the Korea America Group and of the 25 de Mayo Korea Group, both of them from the province of Buenos Aires. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here participating in this panel. In my 13 minutes, I'm going to share with you information about how we think we might reduce the yield gaps in the central region, in the central soybean production region of Argentina. As I don't have too much time, well, technology is not assisting us today. When we think about soybean crops in the central area of the Pampa, the Pampas Prairies, the first question should be, what is our expected yield? And this is related to the resources the crop will have in a crit at a critical time, because it's there where the crop defines the number of grains, which is the main element of yield and, of course, the weight of those grains. We need to have a look at the genotype that has to be the right one for the environment and, of course, in, we have to reduce stress. This is our crop management activity. The second question we should ask about is, well, do we know the limitations set forth by the environment and the probability of their occurrence. So this is the first question. So which is the yield gap I'm willing to accept and which is the risk of economic losses? for that crop. And I think the best way of looking at this is understanding how yield is created, what the potential of a given environment may be, 
and that potential is defined by some defining factors, radiation, temperature, CO2 concentration, and the, those factors vary from season to season. And of course, the genotype I've chosen. And when we talk about areas that where there is no irrigation, it's crystal clear that the yield to be achieved is closely related to the water resource, to the water availability. That is the yield we may achieve in an Dry, in dry land conditions, and it could only be changed with irrigation. And of course, there is a yield that to, to be achieved, which is related to reducing factors and nutrition. I cannot show it on the slides, but well, there is a yield gap related to water supply and the reduction of those limiting factors. There is a paper published together by several universities all over the world which analyzes the yield gaps. For us, those yield gaps are range between one and three tons, and that's the challenge we are facing, what you can see on the screen, is just what happened for a given area, for a given environment in the area of Pehuajó. The sky blue line is the potential yield of the season according to the resources available in the environment. However, the red line is the one that shows the actual yield. No, sorry, defines the differences between the potential yield and the actual yield in the different camp seasons. And you can see that for that area, again, the actual yields range between one and three tons. Well, one or three tons away from that potential yield, possible yield. There are several variables to be corrected whose important importance varies. And this is a management challenge we face in all the regions independently of the region where we are working. There are several management variables. Many of them are cannot be corrected by us. Let's look at the size and the importance of those variables to understand the gap. The first one for us in the central area of the province of Buenos Aires is related to the quality of the lot of the farm. And there is a challenge here, an implicit challenge here. We should think or how we could improve the quality of the environment between a baseline condition and an optimized condition. Well, the difference is re related to the sand concentration and the average responses are 800 kilograms. In red, we have the most relevant figures. Which other factors are very important? The water table, the underground water may reduce or increase the gap, but very often we don't really know the effects of the quality of that underground water and how it influences the crops. Rotation is also important. In long-term trials, there are 300 and 400 kilometers difference if the rotation is done with corn. The genotype, this is just an example, the evolution of the germoplasm and how much they contribute to the to the reduction of the gap. And there are some other factors we sometimes discuss which are not so important, which are the plant populations, distance between rows, but there are some others which are more important, nutrition, phosphorus especially, or net biological availability. And for our environment, something we should never have left behind is the management of herbicides, of residual herbicides. We would have faced fewer problems if we had thought about how to use Resi fertilizers, residues. All these factors don't produce a positive result in all cases. If we look at the way 
the gap can be reduced by these factors while well, the number is about 13 percent and very often there are technology interventions whose results are negative we are working with bioenergy otherwise each of these factors on its own when we look at them in an experimental stage we, the result we get is that we should get a yield of over 10 tons in the case of soybean, and this is not the case. Let's look at this example. On this graph, the most important thing to understand is that the quality of the environment in terms of water supply is much more important than the two other variables. Here we can see I changed the variety or I changed the population density. What is more important to reduce the gap? Well, having enough water supply coming from the underground water table. And the change in variety and the change in plant population density didn't bring about such a big change in, or didn't bring about such an important reduction in the yield gap. So water is more important to reduce the gap than anything other else, which is a net benefit we are getting from germoplasm. Here we see 16 years in the province of Buenos Aires. Here we have selected the best three varieties because of the response. So breeders are helping us out here. There is an increase of 100, 120 kilograms in yield every year. So breeders are helping us out. The next challenge is water. I water table, the supply of water from the water chain. But there may be an issue here. On the left, you can see a graph where we see a scenario, Peiwajo, where on average there are 70 centimeters of water table, and we can forecast this based on the probability of occurrence for the future, considering the historical information from the region, and we may find a scenario like this one. If there is a rainy season, once again, the region will be so the region's yield will be compromised, and if we had just exactly the opposite in the dry, in drier conditions, only in one year the water tables would have the right level to reduce risk. And if it were the driest year ever, the probability would only improve when the water table would be at two meters. Planting date after the environment is the most important variable, however we look at it. So no matter what the genotype is, 20 kilograms per day of delay for high potential environments, this is the penalty we receive when we plant after October the 10th. So for those environments, planting has to be done in October. The next important discussion is rely, related to nutrients supply. And of course, the results of phosphorus is that we should stop thinking that, first, that soya bean cannot, should not receive nutrients, should not be given additional nutrients. Because we see this when we see that that's not the case when we apply phosphorus. So here you see on the slide with the winter nutrition plants, the nutrition we add at planting, and that may reduce the gap, the yield gap, significantly. The important thing is to apply fertilizers. The next big challenge is related to net biological availability. And today, we have to carry out the right process. We know this. It's not good enough to inoculate if we don't do it in the right way, because the response to this biological availability will not be properly achieved. And the next challenge is what would happen if today we would be able to get above seven tons in those environments. We have more than seven and eight tons, the ones I mentioned early on. So in those conditions, we should imagine that we should add nitrogen to soya bean. The trials show, well, rest assured today, nobody thinking of adding nitrogen, but if we 
change the potential of net biological availability of crops, we should think about the response to nitrogen, something which we realize when we are above seven or eight tons. And we see this in the country as a whole because there is a protein loss. The challenge is measurement of heterogeneity. This is what we are doing in the region. If we reduce heterogeneity, we will, we will optimize resources. But the challenge is to understand the different responses that some technology practices may contribute to achieve. So there are some elements which have different behaviors. It's important to imagine that maybe in some environments we might have to think of some products and it's a different environment, a different product should be used. Gap reducing factors, I've already spoken about weeds, we should define the strategies, end of cycle diseases, control. These controls help to reduce the, the gap by 4%, not much more than that. And my final message would be this one. We should be understand for each environment where we work, we should be able to rank the factors, the individual factors that are more relevant when it comes to increasing yield. A protocol should be devised. On the screen, we see an example of a protocol for La Pampa, where we, which we can use to work in an orderly fashion. So, conclusions, reducing gra uh, gaps, yield gaps, consolidating or achieving a reduction of the gap vis-a-vis -vis the potential yield. For this, we have to understand the variables that influence yield, and we should use the right management technology, plant protection, etc. And finally, we should design protocols that help us to organize the choice of the technologies that I'm going to use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo Duarte, for your presentation. And now we continue with Esteban Bilbao, who is an agricultural engineer graduated from the University of Mar del Plata. He's a technical advisor in Agrosur, and he's a member of Necochea Regional. And he worked there in different periods. And he's also a member of the extensive um, Crops Association. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Luis. I didn't want to be um, the last, but uh, I could sabotage him and speak before him. So let's see what happens with soybean in the southern region. That's why I show this picture of a person on a frozen lake. I will talk you. Uh, I will tell you what limits yield. I'm going to tell you that the shoot shouldn't be neglected. I'm going to inform what we are doing, and uh, we will explain what is most important. We've been working on this for many years in different organizations with individual consultants, with company consultants, but we have stopped analyzing one variable to check the complete scenario. We have to add information and learn from each other. The South shouldn't be neglected. This is where we work. We, Our center is Negochea, but also Tres Arroyos and Mar del Plata. I'm going to mention Carué, too. The um, average temperature in summer is 13, 23 degrees, but the evenings are very uh, cool. Rainfall is 600 to 900 millimeters. December, January, and February, 70 to 90. Those are averages from the past uh, 10 years. But we have had rainfall of 30 and 50 millimeters, so the environmental conditions show less potential with the tough more close to the surface. From October to May, 
we have 30, 40 percent probability in March to have frost and that affects soybean. The soils are have water deficit. They are dry soils and there's a lot of tuff. And the tuff in the surface or in low areas near the hills is a problem. Organic matter, one to six. The conditions are okay, the soils are good, but deep depth is not enough. It could be shallow or deep. We have oat, we have first soybean, second bean. In the past years, late corn to replace soybean. And we started with second crop corn or sunflower. In deep, we have larger potential. Everything competes with soybean. We can have barley, second soybean or, cro or corn and organize it as we prefer because this provides more diversity. This is 15,000 hectares and the rotation. 23% corn, then sunflower, soybean, 7% 7, um, 7 wheat and 27 uh, barley. So you can see that not everything is soybean in our area. We have uh, pretty environments like the seaside in Negochea, but we have cold weather. So this is a limitation for soybean. What not uh, enough uh, water availability and cold weather. So let's see what is our strategy. In the most restrictive soils, in genetics, we are using group three, long cycle, and five, short cycle. We are moving towards the southeast, and we have had issues with canker. So group three long and five short. Planting date 15 to 30th of November. So the critical period is January or February. Our population, our density is 200,000 to 250,000, sometimes 300,000. When we started with soybean, we got to 60%, but we were breaking the seed with our augers, but we are achieving 60%, though we still have to adjust and assess seeds better, also planting strategies. Distance between rows 20 to 42, it is a deep seedling. Sometimes we have certain groups that are more stable, usually group two to four long. Planting date, it could be October 25th or the first two weeks of November. If the year is okay, we continue planting until the end of November. Density, 300 to 350,000. Distance between rows, 35 to 42. We also have environments with 52 centimeters, but soybean, based on our temperatures, does not grow so rapidly. So we get to R5, R6 very late, and this is significant. Basically, when we consider weeds, we do not have 21 centimeters distance because if we have a proper microenvironment, we may have sclerotinia issues. What do we do with nutrition inoculation? We need to adjust inoculation and the use of um, seed covers because many times we paint the seed but we don't paint it properly. So we have some information that tells us that nodulation is being affected for pea fertilizers and many times drought in January. This is something we have to study 
And we have also studied foliar reinforcement, inoculation, 40, 60 kilograms of DAB, diamonic phosphate. Sometimes if we go to the west, half the acreage is inoculated, the other half is not. If we want to increase yield, we have to revisit this. Sulfur, we do not have proper information. We are adding some sulfur mixes, basically with barley, and we add 10 to 12 kilograms of sulfur thinking about the upcoming soybean. As to weeds, they are picking up. Eleusina, we use if in the fall we have no frost. We have um, other possibilities. We have very special sorghum plots. Conisa is the most problematic uh, weed. We also have Soncus oleraceus. If we receive Conisa from Uruguay, we will have more problems. Amaranthus, Palmerian hybridus is again a problem. The Brassica napus and Lolium is not so significant, but we still have some. This graph does not include information from three years ago, but you see how weeds are increasing. Raygrass is the most significant. It is the most disseminated. 20% of our plants with Navolsa and 23 with Hybridus and only 0.5% with Palmeri. But people have told us that Palmeri, if we have a hybrid, will come up and pick up very quickly. We have to revisit the distance between rows. We have to go back to residuals and we have to think about this crop and of the upcoming crop. The pest, well, we have millibags. 100% of our acreage, 40% deserves some chemical control of millibags. Many times we do homeopathic applications. Uh, that means that in some areas where applying rates that make no sense and in others more ra higher rates are needed. This is a historical average. So once every time we need an insecticide on soybean. There are other pests like trips to cura and different uh, bugs that uh, we are very uncertain about them. We have different trials. We have the conventional monitoring, but we need to accumulate information. And we think that thresholds are OK, but we still need more data. Fungicide, 3 4% of the surface. Pospora tricucci is the most important fungi. It, it affects most of the plots, and we have not been able to manage it properly. We have had from zero to 200 kilograms, and management is still not OK. This is the pest we have to manage better. We handle the thresholds that are used everywhere in the country with 200 to 400 kilograms. The response is OK. You see the red bar was larger because many of our clients did different rates of fungicides. And the most important thing here is monitoring. We have to use monitoring much better. Which is the future? Well, the future starts today. This is a um, traffic light, the green Soybean in our area is OK because it intensifies. It's the best second crop we have. It adds diversification, basically in those high yield plots. For sunflower, soybean contributes to this. We have to work on many different things. We have to adapt 
genetics. We are using genetics that are that was developed for other areas. We have to develop uh, temperature tolerant seeds. We have to assess distance between rows, and we have to think about new technologies for weed management. We have to adjust nutrition if we want to increase yields, cover crops. We have 30 to 50 percent of winter cover crops. This year we are still harvesting at this time of year. We have to assess this. We are testing things. A Brazil is working there. We have a good tool, but we have to find where to apply it. To cura is the disease we have to fight. We cannot control it, not yet, and it is affecting our plants. The environment, is, the environment is very necessary to be considered. And why do we say that tomorrow is late? Because we have to adopt monitoring technologies. And we have to manage difficult weeds that are coming up and picking up in our plots. This year, probably, things will be different. And we need more agronomy. We need to use more agronomical principles and ideas, more management strategies. Thank you very much. We thank the speaker for his presentation. Now we give the floor to Luis Robles Terán, an agricultural engineer, a career advisor, an expert in weeds. Weed control. First of all, Pepe, thank you very much for inviting me to address you. Esteban is wearing a coat because he comes from the south. I'm just wearing a shirt because I come from the north. I'm an advisor to a CREA group in the area of Chaco and close to Santiago del Estero. And I would like to tell you that it's north, above the north, because everybody thinks, when you talk about the north, everybody thinks of Córdoba. But there's something above that. There is a bigger north. And you may get up to Salta and Jujuy those areas where I, have, where I used to work. Today I'm going to talk about Chaco and Santiago, our cultural area, the hypothesis we are using to improve yields of soya bean especially, how to manage fallow, the importance sorry, of stubble and other activities. The cross is showing Tucumán, the area where I came from, and everything else on that slide is the area of the Chaco, close to Santiago del Estero, an area in the north, a very warm area, and in the case of the CREA group, there are about 140,000 of soya bean crops. And I'm also showing you the corn acreage, because corn is another crop that assists, assists uh, soya bean crops. The results of three years of tests in three areas and in three campaigns, considering the amount of water, taking soil samples, and considering many variables, has enabled, has enabled us to create this pyramid where at the bottom we have the environmental conditions and the weather. Those are the ones that most influence yield. 25% is related to planting dates, 17% is fallow, and only 17% is related to the variety or the technology used. Here you can see a series of 100 years in the area of Kimili. And I'm going to show you several charts which are very interesting, but try to bear with me. I will describe the core of each chart. Here you can see the huge variability 
We have this year, we had a year of almost 1,000 millimeters of rainfall. Last year, we had only 300 millimeters, the previous one 400. So the rainfall variability is huge. And regarding temperatures, so we have sometimes between December and March, 90% of the days the temperature is above 30 degrees centigrade, and many days with the temperature above 35, so the water requirement is very high. Despite this, and despite this 100 years history, look at the colors, colors of this picture. Though we have had some very dry years and some very humid years, there are no years with zero rainfall. This is because we have, be, we have developed the environment in our, our area is continuously growing, including new farms. In the past, Plots that were used for cattle farming are now used for crops. Today, we are introducing new ways of doing agriculture, and this has enabled us to create safer baselines and achieve higher ceilings, higher yields. This is the development of the environment for us. Cover crop and stubble are here. You see sorghum that may have 15 to 20 tons of dry matter. Sorghum, just like corn, are tools that help us to improve our soya bean seeds. We can see that those environments we have soya bean, soya bean, soya bean, we may have 2.5 to 5 tons of stubble for each kilogram of stubble. With, for each additional kilogram of stubble, we have additional three for each ton, sorry, of stubble, we have three additional kilograms of soya bean yield. So, on this graph, where we have 20, sorry, 12 years of information of the Los Gatos group, we can know, we can really see how useful stubble is. And you might wonder why, besides corn and so do we, don't you use a winter crop or wheat? Well, winter crops are not very good for this area. We may have them one or two years in every 10 years, so we must. And if we have only three opportunities, what should we do? And this is what we are trying to find with cover crops. But we are just starting with this and among the list of cover crops, which one should we choose? Because we use wheat, but there are many. Disadvantages here, what we could do when we do this every year, and we may do it several, year, several times, regarding fallow, is this. We are applying this herbicides, <laughs> so we keep a clean plot, all the fallow that is there between April to January with very low herbicide costs. And what I see here in the columns is 15,000 hectares broken down according to the yield and according to the weed management method used. So the better we manage the weeds, the higher the production. But besides, we have learned to manage weeds at the lower cost per hectare, so we have lower costs and more yield. What you can see here is part of that three years trial in three lots with three different planting times, planting dates, and this is showing whether we are doing the right thing or the wrong thing. You can see a red curve where we see what the environment is calling for, what, what the, what, how much water the environment needs. The purple one is a long cycle soya bean, and the green one is a group five soya bean. So we are saying, which are the requirements of the environment and of the site or, and of the soya bean variety? The soya bean comes after wheat, and it starts with 150 millimeters, which for us is very tight and quite scarce. That's why I tell you that wheat is not always a good choice. If you look at the same curve, here it starts higher because 
it comes after corn. So we have it. We have 250 millimeters, and for us, this may be life and death it, because it may be 3,000 or 1,000 kilograms yield. If we delay this, and instead of starting December the 7th, we start on January the 24th, we have more water, and the soya bean gets to its critical stage at a time when the higher temperature, when the highest temperatures are lower. Which are the conclusions to be drawn from this trial? That the, well, the main planting date for us should be early December, as we used to do 10 years ago. Now the planting date dates have been moved to December the 20th to January the 5th. And another important lesson learned is that the groups five and six are a great tool for us. We thought that it was an aggressive approach. However, the trials and the field conditions have shown us that in our area, it's using short cycle groups is to be very conservative. These are results of several seasons in Chaco, in Santiago Chaco area, where we see that group eight the blue line, though it hasn't been easy, and though it has taken us many years to achieve this group eight, is dropping because it doesn't make so much sense to use it in our area. And the one that has grown significantly, 60 or 70 percent this year, is groups C, six and five. We won't stop using group eight because they help us on the time distribution of harvesting, etc. But well, it has not been easy to make the changes. But now we know that group five is key for us. So in the pyramid, we consider not only maturity, but also technology. The intact technology, which we started using five years ago, is widespread nowadays, and you may see for our area, for the tough years, Intacta provides additional yield vis-a-vis -vis RR1 soybeans. Don't, I don't have the results of this year's season, but these are results of the trials. So in two years, tough years, regarding the weather in Takta was far ahead of RR1, and this year when the rainfall was really in, really high, RR1 was, had better yields than in Takta. This means that the knowledge is very useful and it's a kind of reinsurance because when there's not enough when the conditions, environmental conditions are not good, intacta is better than RR1. And what do the farmers do while they do this? The soya bean acreage includes mainly group six and intacta, the big orange bar. And this is what I wanted to share with you. This is what our era looks like. It's not easy, but that's how we manage it. And finally, I'd like to thank all those people that make, that enable us to improve and to get better every day. That's my team and our, and my family in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis, for your presentation. And now we have some time for questions and answers. So we have now 10 minutes for the Q&A session. I don't know if any of you has got any, but I'm going to be reading them. Or I will make questions myself. So, Gustavo, you mentioned uh, mm, yield, uh, yield gaps. Uh, yesterday, another presentation talk about potentials, and he said that we are close to uh, getting that, but sometimes we have certain uh, interactions. So what do you think? How far are we from that yield that is uh, possible? It is not the potential. What are the most important factors that we have to consider to find this? Well, if you check uh, the percentile 95 when you assess a bigger database, 
which is uh, the kind of database we have at APRESID or at ACREA. You see that the gap in the West Sunday area, you realize that the capture of that, uh, the capture level of that potential yield is uh, is uh, between 80 to 90 percent of the potential yield uh, capture. So we are very close, but in very um, few plots. So we have to look and see what was the opportunity that allowed us to have that yield. So if we assess the wheat uh, gap, it did not come up to what we had imagined. Some yields are not even in the simulation models. We explore the 7,000, 8,000 kilograms, and in some plots, in some sites, we got it. What do those sites have? Well, they gather everything I mentioned in my presentation. People took care of the genotype. They adjusted nutrition, not only with P, but also borum and sulfur. They paid attention to planting date, which is a very powerful variable. And that's it. What uh, seems uh, very simple, sometimes we miss it. So I believe the challenge we have ahead, even though we have this list of things to take care of, is to understand what is the contribution of each variable to the final result. Can you see the result of liquid fertilization in R1, or is it too late? I believe this refers to P fertilizer. With P, uh, I don't think of P in R1, but it's clear that uh, maybe this is the last time to apply this fertilizer, basically with borum. That is my experience. This would be the last phenotypical moment for applications. We have seen some later applications, but responses become less significant. In my area, liquid P, no, but some N, yes. We've seen uh, erratic responses, but in some cases, 200 kilograms as response. And it depends a lot of what happened before, water stress and its impact, and how the year evolves to see if the potential can be expressed or not. Uh, this is an average. Uh, it's not an average when I say 200 kilograms. It is a specific situation. In my area, P is quite important. Um, we have a large uh, part of uh, P per million, one, two points. This is not a limitation for us. In my list, uh, the S and bottom contribution on average is about one quintal. Dispersion in some cases implies that you have to add technologies. You have to check the f response frequency, the positive response frequency. And you see that these uh, positive responses increase in our area. Have you assessed N fertilizer in second soybean? No. In some time in my life, yes, I did some trials on, on that, but responses were associated to bad nodulation levels. So when you can arrange everything, when you have net biological uh, application in a second soybean, I think there's no need for N fertilizer, not in my area. It could be a scenario because currently the discussion is based on what is 
going on with the low protein levels, you start thinking about uh, that net biological fixation is not contributing as much as needed. And that comes up uh, as an exploratory issue. We have some responses, yes, but we are having seven, eight tons, so we are far from imagining end fertilization in soybean. In your environments that you are including with inoculation, do you have responses in areas where there is no soybean background? It is very linked to the climatic issues we are having. We have a one-year plot, and we compare it with a 10-year plot, and sometimes there are no differences. What I can say is that we find it very significant how to start with a new plot. It is no burning. The cleaning of the plot is different. We use a lot of gatum, and then we go into soybean before corn. This is for new plots. That explains their potential. Those plots that we have to start uh, that are not new, the first year produce a, a number of kilograms, and this year, they have produced more, 5,000 kilograms. If we have more water, we can do more, of course. Esteban, in those environments that you considered inferior, is water limitation? Would you reduce a distance between rows or number of rows? Will drought in late dates be more negative. Yes, in my area, second soybean can be 3,100 to 5,000, and first soybean, on average, 2,200, and high yield, 2,800. So yields are low. And we have seen that when we reduce or increase distance between rows, up to 52, the response has not been significant. There are no benefits in reducing or increasing distance. Limitations come from other factors, so distance is not so significant. We are always depending on rain. So when you talk about potential yields, water is our limitation because when we had 4,000 kilograms in one plot, the one difference was rain. There were rains and yields were different. These are environments where rotation is okay, but in shallow, environments, distance is the same. Rainfall is the big difference. Okay, we have run out of time. So thank you very much, Esteban, Gustavo, and Luis. And thank you for listening.